Um, this is uh, Renaud Visage. We haven't seen each other for a year. It's been a while. Um, but we, uh, I interviewed Renault in Beirut, in uh, Lebanon, about a year ago. We had a very good conversation. So, what have you been doing in the last year or so? Um, well, we, I personally had a busy year. Uh, even Bright acquired two, company, two, two companies last year uh, in the music independent scene. So, we acquired Ticket Script in Holland and Ticket Fly in the US. So we've been very busy uh, onboarding all these new employees into the uh, company and reshuffling a bit how we function to be able to absorb them. Um, and then personally, I was uh, also working with a, a fund, Index Ventures, as a venture partner, uh, trying my hand at uh, investing and learning a lot about the investment space. So that was an interesting year, for yes, sure. Yes, absolutely. Um, does, does everyone know who Eventbrite is, if you put your hand up? So it's kind of 50-50, so maybe you should tell us a bit about the company, sure. how long you've been going, blah, blah. So we, today we're the largest event ticketing company in the world, based on the number of events we host. We have uh, more than, last year we had three million events on the platform. Uh, so we make it easy for anyone to create events and sell tickets. Um, events like this one, uh, over the years, we started in 2006 in San Francisco. Um, really targeted the US market for a long time and in 2011 we started international, our international expansion. Today we sell tickets in 180 countries I think around the world. Uh, we have offices in 12 countries. Um, we grew through organic growth, of course, focusing at early on on the very long tail. So this very small events, informal gatherings. Uh, and over the years, we've gone into more mainstream music festivals, large concerts, music venues, sporting events, all kinds of uh, much larger, um, more enterprise events, if you, if you might say. Um, last year, we, we crossed the big threshold. We reached 10 billion in ticket sales. 10 billion? Cumulative, so over the entire lifetime wow. of the company. Um, for us, it was impressive to see the number. We, we didn't realize that we had crossed that until uh, we put all the numbers together. Um, and we're about 700 people now distributed across 12 countries. And how do you make the, what's the business model? How do you make money out of those 10 billion tickets? So free events are still 100% free. Uh, you can use it for any kind of free events. And then we take a commission on ticket sales. So if you, uh, as an organizer, sell tickets, we take a, a low commission on, on the ticket sales directly. Okay, so it's not just music and the long term. Just to go back to the long tail of music, you're concentrating on independent music and that sort of thing. Was that because you couldn't compete with the big boys? Was that a strategy? It's not that we can compete, and we do compete on certain markets, like music festivals. Our competitors are very active. They have the market. We have a part of the market now that we've gained over the years. We just felt that the independent music scene and music venues in North America, for example, was a market that was very interesting for us and where the big boys were not as interested. So. With the Ticketfly acquisition, for example, we have more than 2,000 venues across the US and Canada. Um, and it's access to a talent pool of musicians, incredible. And the wide variety of um, uh, performances that happen at these venues uh, really enrich the platform and, and is really aligned with our goal of being the, the widest, most av available range of um, events and things to do in general uh, across uh, the entire world. So it would be like non-stadiums? We do some stadiums, so we have reserved seating offerings as well. We just don't do the big acts, like right. the U2s of the world yet, at some point maybe in the future, but we decided to focus on what's a bit less competitive, but very much uh, more recurring also, right. like music venues, they have acts every night almost, and it's a great business, I think, for us to conquer. So you've been in business 12 years. Why did you start in the US? Uh, we started at the beginning of 2006. So it's no, yeah, but why did you start in the North America? Um, I mean, startups, Silicon Valley, my co-founders were there, and we thought 
Um, first of all, we, we started there because we had friends in the event space, in the tech event space. So the tech crunch at the time, I think, was starting to be popular and they started having events, they started having disrupt. Uh, we did the ticketing platform for that and then expanded into other tech spaces in the US first then a bit more globally. And then we went beyond tech into uh, music, sports, all kinds of different okay. festivals. So it's not just music, it's festivals, it's conferences like this? Oh yeah, conferences is still, uh, at least a third of our revenue is no conferences. Way. Wow, okay. So in those 12 years, there must have been some, I mean, there's probably a lot of uh, entrepreneurs here. Uh, there must have been a few downs as well as ups. I mean, like any company, we, we had our ups and downs. Um, Wait, we, were you VC funded the whole way through? Sorry? Were you VC funded? So we were bootstrapped for two and a half years with uh, either my co-founder's money at the beginning or family and friends. Um, we tried to raise in 2008, but that's exactly at the time of the financial crisis. So when all the VCs shut their doors, said, we don't invest anymore, it's too risky. Uh, you should buckle down and <laughs> survive if you can, and then we'll see. Um, so we were lucky to be able to, to raise a bridge round in 2008, early on, uh, when we, because we tried to go out and raise money and couldn't. Nobody wanted to invest. So we um, managed to get enough to survive until the end of 2009, and that's where we raised our Series A with uh, Sequoia. Right, okay. with Sequoia. I don't know if you know, but uh, in the recession, in the bad days, there was a document from Sequoia Capital, it was about 62 pages, basically saying that if you're not profitable, you will never raise money ever again. You, you remember that one? You know? Oh yeah, very much so. And then the, and, and the, everyone's just like, Jesus, we're fucked completely. <laughs> it was rest in peace, good, good times. Absolutely, absolutely. And then they were the ones that invested in you, so that's quite impressive. Yeah, I guess we, we managed to tell a good story towards the middle of 2009. Our growth was good. We survived the crisis. We actually thrived during the crisis because a lot of people had lost their job or had more time or were thinking about their careers. So networking events really took off. Um, we managed to grow, I think, more than 100% year over year, 2008, 2009. Well, okay. So we had really good numbers entering into our fundraising period at the end of 2009. How close do you think you were to closing the doors? Um, I don't think we were close. Like we, we managed to, I mean, we had a really good network in the Valley. We had p powerful friends, I think, that could have backed us if we needed to. But it was already three years after we started the company. So we were really needing that validation from, from the VC community that this was a venture-backed business that we had the um, perspective of becoming a unicorn one day and v v getting that funding from Sequoia was really that validation yeah, yeah. that we needed. It kept me going. Um, I suppose we were talking earlier on a previous panel was slightly more chaotic than this one. It's a very polite conversation um, about the myth of failure and what failure means and all that stuff. So I think more relevantly to you, you went for a period of growth and you know you were you, you were you know, clearly reveling and doing very well. But in that period of relative failure or relative non-success, what were the lessons that you learned over that time? Was it patience? Was it the fact that you had people you could trust, the people who came in for you? What was it? I think the main lesson was to really focus on the, on the fundamentals of the business. So we were always very frugal. We always tried to find ways to cut costs if possible. Very pay, paying close attention to the bottom line over the years with hired a lot in, in different periods when we had a lot of capital, but always thinking that we needed to be a profitable business at some point soon, or being close to that and have the levers that we needed to become profitable if, if another 2008 happened. So it, it teaches you how to uh, manage your company, uh, I think, and that's the, the most important lesson is that most startups fail because they run out of cash at some point. Well. They can have bad ideas, but the main reason if they have good ideas that they fail is because they don't manage it properly. And there's countless examples of companies that have overextended at some point in time. So be very conscious of where you're spending your money and don't wait until it's too late to raise your next round. Absolutely. Like You should be raising when you don't need the money also. And that's something we did very well after in subsequent years. 
At that time, were there vultures circling around you, knowing that you were in trouble? Someone was trying to acquire you cheaply? Yeah, I think we had a few offers that were very low at the time. And some of our competitors actually sold for very low amounts during that at, period. At the same time? Yeah. So you stayed strong? I mean, we didn't really, we were not interested in an e easy exit for low multiples. That, that wasn't why we were in business. We wanted to build a big sustainable company that would really change the game in the ticketing industry and that the outcome would not have been no, the absolutely. one we wanted to have. So, so you bought um, TicketFly and TicketScript this year. Had you made any acquisitions after the capsule from Sequoia? Had you made yeah, we've before. made smaller acquisitions in the past. So we acquired a ticketing company in South America. There were about 10 people when we acquired them. We've grown the team a lot. It's one of our main in engineering centers now. Okay. Uh, we have about 50 engineers in, in Mendoza in Argentina. Uh, we've acquired technology companies. So we acquired a RFID-based technology uh, company in Canada to build our entry management system. Um, we acquired, we did talent acquisitions as well, Lanyard in the UK, for example. Absolutely. Uh, the founders of Django yep. joined the team, they're still on the team. Um, but TicketScript and TicketFly were really a, a step up in so terms these, of size. So these, these literally are two big deals for you? Yeah. Okay. One is North America, which I think is TicketFly. Tell, Tic tell us about the companies. So T TicketFly had been in business for quite a while. They got acquired by Pandora a few years ago and Pandora sold it uh, to us last year. Uh, it's a very bright founders and who had had success selling their business to Ticketmaster in the past. Right. Uh, so we had been competing for the same type of deals for quite a while and we thought that it would make sense to combine our efforts instead of fighting each other. Similar with TicketScript, we were making headways in Europe, but we thought well, we could really Dutch, accelerate. Dutch? Yeah, they're Dutch, Dutch yeah. Um, based, but um, they have clients in Holland, of course, Germany, Belgium, Spain. So it, it was really a way for us to accelerate our penetration of the music space in, in Europe. Uh, someone pulled a knife on me in Arnhem once in a cafe. A big bread knife tried to stab me. That's what I remember about Arnhem. <laughs> Just food food. Um, okay, so 2017, two big acquisitions added 250 employees to your to your roster. About yeah. So now you have 700. Now you have some time to integrate them into the company, and you need to you know expand. So what will, what will you be doing in 2018? So I think a lot of. Um the success of acquisitions depends on your plan when you go into the acquisition mode. And we had a lot of discussions with both companies before we acquired them to, make, to have a clear plan and to have their backing of the founders. So the founders of both companies are still with us. They're actively um, managing the business in Europe and the music business in, in um, North America. We we made the decision at the time to integrate their, their software into the Eventbrite platform. So this is something we started. It's a big effort. Uh, we have to migrate all their customers to the Eventbrite platform. So 2018 is going to be a big, a big part of it was going to be about that integration, uh, making sure the teams work well together, making sure we tell a compelling story to the music independent scene, um, that we are the main actor in that space. And then continue our international expansion. We have a few offices in Europe, several offices in Latin America. We want to really nail these markets um, before we start expanding elsewhere oh, in okay. Asia or uh, Africa. For Do you example. plan to make any more acquisitions? Sorry? Plan Maybe, to make? yes. That's yeah. with I think acquisitions are very powerful as long as you make sure that the founders are aligned with your vision, that you've done the due diligence work to make sure that is, it is the case. If you can retain them, then it's a much better proposition to put some money on the table to combine efforts, if yeah. possible. So that's why we've um, acquired these particular companies. We had been in touch with them for quite a few years before we made the acquisition, and that's really important for us. So for you personally, 12 years, it's a long time. You still love the shit? Yeah, I think there's, I mean, 
Buying a ticket is still not as easy as it should. Reselling it is definitely not as easy as it should. There's new technologies that we're thinking about, like blockchain, that could have transformational uh -huh. impact, I think, on the business. Secondary ticketing, for example, is being regulated by many different countries. It's going to be a much tougher act to resell your ticket. So what, what else can we do in the next 10 years to continue uh, disrupting the business. So you'll be here for another 10 years, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's always been our intention to be right, a, a long-standing company. Long-tail company for long-term If we can, yes. Yeah, so okay. that's, that's the goal. Uh, just a question to the audience. How many of you find it a really happy experience uh, buying a ticket? And how many find it a fucking awful experience buying a ticket? Okay, so this is what you've got to deal with. So we still have some work to do, apparently. So, ha so to the audience, how, how are you going to help them have a better experience? So send me your feedback, by the way, if you have any. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, I mean, I, mean I, I think Ticketmaster is the work of the devil. Right? So w one way we've started doing that, uh, making it easier and, and more seamless is by doing our distributed commerce partnerships. What, so does, that, what does that mean in English? <laughs> We, we sell through Facebook, for example. So we have oh, a, right. an integration with them. You can publish your event to Facebook and buy directly your tickets on the Facebook platform. So it's much more, it's wherever you are that we will be trying to be also. So okay. you don't have to jump to another platform. You can use the credit card you have on file with Facebook. We're doing similar partnerships with Spotify, for example, where you can buy your tickets right there on the Spotify platform. So the user experience on Facebook would be, who would set up the Facebook page? You guys. Well, the, the event creator publishes their event on Eventbrite, and then there's a one-click publish to Facebook, and that pushes all the tickets to Facebook, and then you can, uh, consumers can buy directly on either the Facebook page or through their news feed if wow. they get relevant recommendations for those. And you do it on Spotify as well? Yes, we, it's a lighter integration at the moment, but we're thinking, and, and we have many more partners in the pipeline to do that. And when it comes into kind of revenues, is that very small at the moment, or is it? And we started at the beginning of 2017, and we've already sold millions of tickets through that partnership, right, okay. different partnerships. So okay. It's definitely growing. It's something that a lot of our partners want to do. They want to create they want to keep you on their platforms. And it's our best interest and the organizer's best interest to have our inventory distrib as distributed as possible. So all the interests are aligned, and the consumer also doesn't want to be having to have multiple uh, wallets on two different platforms. Absolutely, so absolutely. Makes sense. Well, so what, what about the community and post-event? How do you keep these people on the platforms? Do you do other innovative things or...? Um, I mean, we don't provide that many tools for post-event. Uh, I think there's other tool sets that you can use to engage your community. And Facebook is betting big, I think, on events to be that platform where the exchanges happen between the organizers and, and their, um, the people who are interested in, in attending or have similar common interests. So we we'll, might do some things there, but it hasn't been and probably won't be in 2018 our main focus. Right, OK. We did mention the dreaded word blockchain. I found, I found out something yesterday that in English, it's the blockchain if you're talking about Bitcoin, but it's blockchain if you talk about anything else, which I didn't know. And there's some information for you. So blockchain in the music industry, in the ticketing industry, uh, there's, there would appear to me to be some obvious things where blockchain is going to work. Aid, healthcare, banking, obviously. But the music industry being so fractured and interoperable, I mean, will it work? I mean, that's exactly the reason why I think blockchain can have a big impact. It's because it's fragmented, there's so many players, there's so many interested parties. If you think of a big concert, like you have the artists, the promoters, the production company, the promo promoting company. So there's all these actors who are interested, and then there's the consumers who want to buy their ticket, also want to buy when it's sold out on the secondary markets. So all these players have to somehow exchange data. And without blockchain allows you to do that in an untrusted way, which I think is very powerful. As long as you can verify that the um, uh, transaction happened and that you have a mechanism to control 
how much you can resell for, for example, built into your ticket as a smart contract. That could be very powerful yeah, the for the yeah, yeah. event creators to gain all the revenue they can along the whole chain of the life cycle of the ticket. But would that be something that you would do or someone else would do? Or, or would it begin that, in another part of the music industry? So I think blockchain as a technology is very interesting. How you apply blockchain? Is it a consortium of companies getting together? Is it a public blockchain? Is it a private blockchain? I think those will be determined over the years. I don't have the answer right now. I think we, a lot of companies are starting to think about it. There's some ICOs around the ticketing space from very small companies trying to disrupt them, this industry. Um, I think we're very well positioned because we have a wide breadth of inventory available. Um, we also want to be part of the secondary space at some point, probably. So it makes sense to at least experiment with the technology and see if we can build a better experience. Yeah, okay. Because in the end, if, if it's just technology, it's not important. No, absolutely. But if you build a better, more satisfying experience for all of you guys, then I think we'll have succeeded in integrating that into our... I'll be interested in the ICOs that have uh, gone to ICO in the ticketing business. What type of things are they? Um, a lot of uh, technology provider, uh, so they try to have a token that will regulate the interactions of the players who um, participate in the network. Um, it's a lot about control of the ticket lifecycle, so when, when you buy it, when you resell it, when you attend the event. Um, so it's, it's a bit, I think, presumptuous sometimes for the startups to think that they can just come in and with just one piece of technology totally disrupt the relationships that exist. But hopefully some projects will get traction and, and like any industry, it takes time to disrupt something. Yeah, it sounds a lot like fintech, right? Um, there's a company in the UK called Twickets. Have you heard of them? Yeah, yeah we he's a nice, talked to them as well. He's a, he's a really nice guy, right? Uh, and Twickets is, is a, a forum for fans well, if you can't go to the concert, you put your, your, your ticket on Twickets and then you just pay the same price, you know what I mean? And I used it once and it was a really good experience. Yeah, I think uh, fair reselling has been uh, quite popular with new startups. So yeah, 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 yeah well, which I think is right, yeah? You, you know. I think it depends on, on whoever puts, puts up the event. If they don't really care about having a fair value for their ticket prices, then... Yeah, but going, but going to a concert, or a well, concert, going to a gig, it's not a commodity, it's an experience, right? You, you know what For I mean? For sure, yeah. And, and then if, there's a story that I hear every year about Glastonbury Festival in my country. You know, tickets to Glastonbury go on sale, da, 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 and they sold out in one and a half minutes, da, 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 da. I mean, I think that's, you, that's terrible. Number one, it's a lie, right? You know what I mean? Because it, it's impossible. And number two, it's like, there seems to be there seem to be bots or people that know how to play the system. I mean, how do you fix that? The blockchain not blockchain. Sorry, is not going to fix that, or or maybe you're not going to be able to fix that. But how do you change that? Well, you have to find uses for the technology that makes makes it a lot harder for these bots or uh, bad actors to be part of the chain. And is that, is that being challenged now? Has it changed? Yeah, I think this is a big push by most of the major ticketing companies to favor the fans somehow. So you have to identify that someone is a fan. You have to make it easier for them to pre-buy before the actual Absolutely. sale opens. We, we, with the Ticketfly acquisition, we got Burning Man, for example, as one of our big events. And there's a lot of um, speculation on how you get tickets for Burning Man. So they try to be very conscious about how they go on sale, how do they favor people who have been before. So there's a whole... Um, plan for how, how to successfully fill the 100,000 or whatever, however many uh, places they have for Burning Man in a very equitable way. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think these are trendsetters for how to do th so, so, so selling th th properly. So th things are moving. Yeah, I think and we th are, things I'm not, are moving. I'm not blaming think... you for this broken model, but I mean, it's been so broken for so long. For sure. You know, and it's about time. And the regulators are also starting to realize that it's a bad industry in a Absolutely. lot of places. So they're putting in place, in the UK especially, I think oh, they're really? pretty drastic about what you can and cannot do as a secondary seller. Yeah. Uh, Google just put out some policies for Google advertising about what you can sell as a secondary sale for tickets. Yeah. I, can't, I, mean, can't be that I mean, if I go to a big football match or a big concert, 
there are these horrible, fat, dirty, greasy men. You want a chicken, you sad cab, I'll give you a fucking you for it. Why, why is this not regulated? Why, why does this still go on? It is regulated, but... But, it, but no one does anything about it. You still have the paper, so the paper has value. It's like selling bills outside. Yes, it's going to incentivize people to do that, as long as you pre don't prevent them from uh, doing the physical act of exchanging something for money. But, it, but can't it just be like my boarding pass for, for a flight? Exactly, I think mobile can't tickets is, that? is I mean, the solution, for sure. That seems obvious, but there you go. Harder to put in place. People are very attached to their physical tickets for something. We I, found out. I, I remember <laughs> used to go to like football matches, and I used to get you know like European yeah, yeah. Cup final, so and so like beautiful tickets. Now tickets, man. No one gives a shit about tickets. Oh, they do. They are ugly. They do. We yeah. have to provide physical tickets to a lot of our clients. And, you do, and they look good. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, <laughs> send me a ticket. Yeah, send me a ticket. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, we're running out of time. Um, we were going to ask some questions, but. I couldn't work out the technology, um, so sorry about that. Um, great audience of entrepreneurs that are having trouble buying tickets. Clearly would like to buy tickets. It seems that you're um, doing some stuff to sort it out. Thank you very much. Uh, any words of wisdom for, for the people if they're trying to run a company and not buy tickets? Um, so, so no, instead of buying tickets, that's the audience, but if they're entrepreneurs and they've, you know, you've got 12 years of experience, are there any final words of yeah, advice? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a great journey. I've learned so much over the last 12 years. I think one thing I've learned is that every step of the way, you're going to have to reinvent yourself. Um, as the company grows, as your role changes, as you bring talent on board. So think about what you want to become once the company is successful. And it, it doesn't mean that you have to be CEO forever, for example. A lot of founders are better suited for being chief product officer or CTOs or whatever. So I think that's one of the great freedoms of being a founder is that you can decide what your path is within the company. And I've personally had to change my role several times. I've always tried to find the technology project that's most important for the company and focus on that rather than focusing on controlling all the engineering Absolutely. teams, myself, for example. So find what you're passionate about. It's a great enabler. Like you can really work on things that or that motivate you and get you out of bed every day. Um, but it's it's a f fascinating journey, and I encourage you if if you haven't started to think about uh, what companies you could be building. Awesome. Okay, uh, I've learned a lot. I'm glad that you're sorting this stuff out. I know it's not your fault. We'll fix it for you. Absolutely. But uh, a round of applause for Renaud Vizals, please. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.